welcome to this week's episode of G&D Media. Our guest this week is Professor Kevin Anderson. He's what, what can we say? He's a friend of the show. He's been coming on the show for the last three years and it's kind of a bit of a ritual now. We kick off the year and have a bit of a recap to see where we are as humanity fighting climate change. Uh, we cover a whole host of things, including, well, where we are as a climate movement and what's the current situation to do with carbon emissions how net zero can you know be a help and a hindrance in kind of organizing and developing policy and strategy um political cowardice from the people at the top of our country when it comes to climate change and what we could be doing instead of just dumping all the responsibility of climate change on individuals it's a great show me and Ads is a great time hope you enjoy it Hello, you're listening to uh, G&D Media with the Green New Deal podcast. I am your host and producer, Andrew Glassford. And as ever, I am joined by uh, North Manchester's greatest climate activist, world's best beard enthusiast. It's Adam Williams. How the hell are you, Adam? I'm great, mate. Thanks for inviting me once again to be on your show. <laughs> well, <laughs> it, it feels like that sometimes. <laughs> Just the be- beating heart of uh, of green media in Manchester. Definitely, definitely, um, mate. Well, we're going to crack on with it because we, we've kind of got a bit of our uh, a tradition to uphold uh, right now. So uh, this episode is kind of, like I was just saying, it's become a bit of a ritual. It's a bit of a way we start our year at G&D Media. We've got to have a bit of a, a palate cleanser, like a, a bit of slice of reality to refocus the mind, to remind ourselves that everything changes, but our aims must still be the same. We started this show to discuss climate change and climate breakdown, to keep banging the drum for it. A better world that doesn't require us, the human race, to leave half the globe to cataclysm. That doesn't allow oil barons to control the quality of our our life and the lives of our neighbours down the street. And maybe think that we're not just vessels to squeeze productivity out of. Today, we're getting our yearly update from one of our favourite guests of the show and favourite scientists. To, maybe we shouldn't have favourite scientists, we'll get into that in the conversation. Uh, to <laughs> keep us on track and let us know how much more has to be done. It's Kevin Anderson. Kevin is the Chair of Energy and Climate Change at the School of Mechanical, Aerospace and Civil Engineering at the University of Manchester and works at the Tyndall Centre for Climate Change Research. Kevin, how the devil are you? Yeah, I'm very well, thanks. Um, yeah, looking forward to the joys of 2024. <laughs> well, yeah, I think I think that's exactly where we'll start. So, uh, <laughs> as you were just saying, yeah. it's, a, it, it's a, uh, a a new year, you know, that time is, is, the, is, a, is kind of... I suppose the big thing when we talk about climate change and the environment movement and we have lots of targets based on years. How do you feel at the start of 2024? Where are we? Do you think we're kind of uh, going towards the right space right now? Well, from a purely sort of scientific and mathematical perspective, we're 40 billion tonnes worse off than we were last year. Um, Wow. And by the end of this year, we'll be 40 billion tonnes of CO2 worse off again. Um, let alone the other greenhouse gases on on top of the of the carbon dioxide. So this is uh, I often use when when other people talk about oh we've made some progress here we've made some progress there we've not made progress we've just just the strides backwards are a little bit more shallow than they would otherwise be. But until we start yeah. to reduce our emissions at at a rate that we need to or slightly faster than that we just go backwards because it's a cumulative problem. Yeah. Every day we fail it's a bit harder the next day. So 2024 is going to be a harder year in terms of what we need to do than it was in 2023, which was harder than it was in 2022. And we've known this for at least 30 or so years. And yet every year we choose to fail. And the we in that is quite an important group. It's generally the the leaders, the elites, including mm-hmm. the academics and the, the senior people in our society who seem to have um, some sort of overall control. Well, it's, it's interesting you kind of bring up bring up the we to start with because you know I, I was kind of thinking about this when I was putting the questions together. You know, you, you've you've been working in kind of you know research around climate change for at least the best part of 10, 15 years, and you know you've got more than that. Worrying me. <laughs> I was try, trying to be. Uh, well, I don't know if it works. Which way it works when talking to an academic? Is it nice <laughs> to say you're younger or you're more experienced? Um, uh, just as I am. <laughs> yeah, yes, as you are. Um, you know, you've got colleagues who've been doing this for similar or even longer periods of time. How does that feel in terms of like your professional capacity for your work? Are you just, do you find yourself just observing things getting worse or do you find that your work is actually having to change significantly as things change as well? 
Well, we certainly observe it, but I, I, I think, well, I see it's in, incumbent on us who are academics, and that's a very fortunate position to be in. Mm. Um, I mean, I'm not, it, it is hard, hard, hard graft. I mean, some people may not believe that, but it is hard work, but it's still an incredibly fortunate position to be in. Mm-hmm. So we have a lot more job security by and large, certainly when we're tenured like I am, but than a lot of other people. So I'm not trying to you know, say we're struggling, but we're, we're in a fortunate position. But we can observe the problems around us. And and that is that de- can be quite depressing because we understand them, I suppose. That's our yeah. day job. Yeah. So we don't just observe them, but we observe them and we sort of we take them on board. At least some of us do anyway. And it means something about the world in which we live. It tells us something about the world in which we live and, and how pleased we are or how sad we are about it and of our role within it. Um, and I think if you observe the world in, in relation to climate change, you, you realize because we are failing so rapidly, then we do have to change what the narrative is about success or whatever, you know, yeah. solutions, responses. I don't really like the word solutions, responses. And it does make us sometimes stop and reflect on are we really dealing with climate change or is climate change really just a symptom of something much broader? And I, and I'm increasingly of the view that that's, that's really the case. That's interesting. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, the situation is considerably worse. And uh, for me, the last three to five, maybe even as many as eight years, perhaps I've yeah. started to realize how absolutely central the issue of fairness and equity is mm-hmm. to addressing mm-hmm. climate change. And that is regardless of our political position. Whether we whether we like a fairer world or a more equitable world is irrelevant. From the maths point of view, to deliver on our commitments, you, we have to deal with fairness and equity. And you cannot squeeze the emissions out of people that don't emit. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's become increasingly evident that the lion's share of emissions come from people who have both the agency to change themselves and the influence within the sort of society to drive a political change, structural mm-hmm. change as well. And so it's made me increasingly think that there are, there are particular groups in society who need to get the message or be more honest, have greater integrity, have greater courage to drive that change. Yeah. And I feel increasingly my role is to inform that group and try and persuade them to do so, or at least persuade others to, yeah. to, to put pressure on that group. Um, Kevin, I first um, went to see you talk in 2018. Um, I took a group from my CLP back when I was uh, back in the Labour Party for my sins um, for a talk at Manchester. I think it was Manchester Metropolitan that uh, you did a talk there. So it just relates a little bit to how many, how many, uh, how much emissions you said we were using every year. Now, back then in 2018, would you say that the path that we've taken since then is something that you expected is it is it worse than you thought it would be and i'm talking not only on a climate perspective but also on a on a political perspective mm. that's a, that's an interesting question actually that well it's, it's it was basically what depends exactly when it was in 2018 or six or seven years ago so um it's not far off a quarter of a trillion tons of co2 ago. wow so yeah from Jesus that Christ. point of view yeah i know that's that's what's wrong it very quickly adds up um so yeah so a lot of emissions have gone since then and we've also had covid in that time which Mm. i think you know has had big repercussions one way or another taught us some lessons other lessons we haven't bothered to learn um and i also think that this may sound a bit strange but we're still living through the legacy of the 2000 and 2007 2008 banking crisis Right. And the process of austerity that was put in place that has been deliberately maintained since then to, again, to increase the inequality in our society. So there have been a number of things played out, I suppose. So we've seen that a massive rise in emissions, both annual emissions have gone up, but also so the total of emissions in the atmosphere has gone up because we haven't we haven't uh, stopped emitting. Yeah, haven't stopped. We've seen ongoing austerity for the majority, for certainly for a large swathe of a society in somewhere mm-hmm. like the UK, but indeed other parts of the world as well. And um, so increased inequality, increased job insecurity and so forth. And then we had COVID in the middle of that, which I think told us something, maybe about the particular government we had and perhaps still have, that how the complete disrespect for the electorate mm. Um either by those people who are behaving appallingly behind behind the uh, the closed doors or those that stayed quiet about it 
or those that 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 have defended it, even if they weren't part of it. And I think it told us a lot about, explained a lot to us about what an appalling policymaker, politician, leader looks like. Yeah. Mm. And perhaps it gave us a sense of what we should really be expecting, which is much, much more out of our leaders. So at every level, I think, I'm trying to think now, is are there any, po- there are some positives that have come out. What we have noticed, and it's been really important, uh, is that the, the, the cost, and therefore some degree the price, of renewable energy has become much, much cheaper. Mm-hmm. So I think now there, there is a wide understanding amongst many people that renewable energy is a genuine viable alternative to fossil fuels. We can't get there immediately. We can't get there tomorrow. But now, if you're going to develop any new energy system, it's cheaper to do it with uh, with uh, renewables than it is with fossil fuels, let alone all the huge other pollution, environmental and climate um, impacts are associated. Now, there are still issues with some issues with storage, but they've often been exaggerated. I I can remember I was talking about this with with someone else yesterday, actually, with my other colleagues. We had really good colleagues working on electricity back in 2005, 2006. And the experts then, these were professors at the top of their field then, quite a few of them said that you will never get more than 20% of the grid provided by renewables because of instability issues. We now have 40 to 50% of the grid, not just in our country, other countries as well, provided by renewables, often provided by renewables. And we've managed with it perfectly well. So uh, um, I think that they've not only demonstrated that their cost is is acceptable, well, is much lower than fossil fuels, but they can be a real major part of our energy system. In fact, we'll have to be a major part, the major part of our energy yeah. system. I think they've demonstrated that as well. But I would also, if anyone was listening to this, bear in mind that um, I you know, lots are. of people at BBC always get this wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, electricity is just about 18 percent of the energy we consume mm. so at the moment we're getting roughly half of our electricity from uh, zero carbon sources half of our electricity but that electricity is just 18 percent of our energy so we get about nine percent of our energy from renewables the other you know 80 odd to 90 percent comes from fossil fuels and we mm-hmm. it's people very regularly muddle up the idea with between energy and electricity when it yeah. comes to energy, heating our homes, transport, heating our businesses and so forth, all of that is basically fossil fuel. Half of our electricity, which is just a small proportion, say less than one fifth of our total energy consumption is actually electricity. So I think we have to bear that in mind when we when we look at the numbers. Yeah, really yeah. important. Yeah. yeah. Like to kind of go back onto the, I suppose, like political leadership point at the moment. Um something i was tweeting about earlier today that ed balls has said that labor should use in on their 28 billion goal for, for green investment and i was just thinking to myself like outside i think that being you know politically political cowardice for the start it also feels like that is coming from a position from someone in relative power someone who's been in power previously and you know has a big you know bully pulpit for being on a national tv show just saying like the most i was uh, from what we're just talking about like economically incoherent and like planet kind of survivability incoherent position whatsoever, but can be said so normally and not like be chastised by other people in his mm. strata. And I kind of don't understand how that's happened. I don't think it's like yeah. denial per se, but it's almost it's like they're able to compartmentalize because it, everything becomes policy and policy can then be, you know, like put, put to a side as opposed to it being, you know, reality and material conditions of of the world. I was trying to think, like, yeah. how does it? How does he say that, like, on his podcast or TV show, and not think about how that extrapolates out across the rest of the system? If you if you see what I mean, like, I don't get how he does that. <laughs> well, I think his politics is is a bit like Johnson's. His politics is about I. It's not about society. Mm. I don't yeah. think Ed Balls ever cared that much about society. I don't think he was ever in the position of leadership either. I mean, he may have had the had the, the title, but I don't think he ever was. But I would agree with him. We do need a, need a U-turn on the 28 billion. It's pathetic. We need 280 billion. Um, yeah. And so he's exactly, gonna, I, yeah. I would say at every single level, he's, he's wrong here. But he was wrong before. I don't expect any difference. <laughs> I mean, his his political prowess is very similar to his dancing, as far as I can yeah. tell. It, it, um, my my and, point is less about him shouldn't... specifically, but more about like kind of people in that political class. Who you know? Yeah. Co- well, it's not just the political class. Um, why are not? Why aren't the other experts speaking out? Where do we mm. hear when when this nonsense is spouted by the great and good in our society? The academics typically stay quiet. The experts typically stay quiet. Mm. And 
uh, you know, it's Thomas More's maxim that silence silence means consent. So by yeah. staying quiet, we are effectively supporting the nonsense that these sorts of idiots are spouting. And he's not alone in this. There are plenty of others of them out yeah. there. Um, they're not driven by cogency. They're not delivered, driven by courage. They're not driven by concern for others. They're not driven by systems level of thinking. Their yeah. world is incredibly narrow. Yeah. Um, and so I really have as, I have as little interest in what Ed Balls has got to say about climate change as I have about Bill Gates. Neither of them know yeah. nothing about the subject and should talk about other things. Yeah. And, well, also, yeah. As, and also as well, I just want to put in there that um, these are people that have um, gained the most out of this system. So we're, we're almost yeah. asking the people that have gained the most out of this <clears> system <throat> to change the system that they've gained the most out of. And I think, you know, they're going to really struggle <laughs> with that to undo um, a system that essentially works for them. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I, I wish I could remember the quote from um, Frederick Bastiat. He was one of Adam Smith's contemporaries, but I used okay. it the other day at the talk, but I can't remember the exact quote. But broadly, it's when you get um, people that have, uh, and he referred to men in particular, but basically people who have, have plundered the system for their own gain, what they then do is write the rules and change the moral code to support yeah. what they've done. If we did have a genuine interest in the huge numbers of people that got shoved into fuel poverty mm. thanks to Putin's war, the reason they were shoved into fuel poverty was because weak politicians hadn't put in place the renewables that were necessary. And so yeah. if we had made the shift towards renewables, we wouldn't have been locked in so much to the European gas market. We weren't buying, I should point out, the UK didn't get very much gas from Russia, but because we're in the European gas market, the price of gas goes up, which means yeah. people over here were forced into fuel poverty. Ed Ball wasn't in fuel poverty. No. But lots of other people that he claims to care about were in fuel poverty, and they were there because of the inadequacy of people like him in driving a renewables agenda, which meant that we would have had indigenous power sources at the same time as Putin, because I don't think it was Russia, as Putin was invading Ukraine. So you know, their lack of foresight, their lack of systems thinking, their yeah. lack of courage is what brought about a huge amount of fuel poverty in the UK. And it, it, even as well, you know, I think it was in... Which is 2009. There was, you know, the closing of some of our, even if they are, if it is gas, some of our biggest gas reserve sites in the country. So even if we were carrying, could carry on in this vein, just by doing that and not having that foresight, made the whole situation even worse. Um, yeah, I we've had get... a, uh, <laughs> on, so we've had on, a policy, very no energy policy in the UK yeah. for, <laughs> for for decades. Um, you yeah, know, probably probably the last energy policy we had, if you would call it an energy policy, was the privatization of electricity. I mean, I wouldn't quite, it was, it was fragmented it, but I mean, we've had nothing since then. Um, you know, and I don't think we've particularly had an agricultural policy either. So two, two elements of society that are absolutely key to running a, a, a decent, fair society, yeah. food and um, energy. I think, you know, governments have reneged on their responsibility on those two areas for decades yeah. of all colors, governments of all colors. Yeah. Like a, oh, go on. We're going to say, and just going back to sort of systems thinking as well, I think the most charitable take I can give, you know, the government is that we have, rather than have sort of like a unified system that's able to, to make decisions sort of on the spot and able to, to change in regards to, you know, what's in, in front of us, everything just seems so fragmented and departmentalized and nobody knows what one department's doing to another and you've got this budget here that you're not allowed to go over and that's not connected to this budget but in reality really those budgets should be connected and you know it's almost and then you and then obviously you've got levels where you've got lobby groups and you've got funding and you've got contracts and you just seem to just pile on top of each other till in the end you know really at the end of the day i think a lot of people especially adults of a certain age recognize that mps are not the best of us you know let's be honest mps are not the best of us they're just dudes in suits you know from a particular background that that make things up on the spot pretty that much like it. most of us do but they do it in the spotlight and it's a bit like relying on people that are not the best of us to do the best for us um in a system that's yeah. so fragmented, so departmentalized that it's almost like trying to push water uphill. And that's just my most charitable take. I mean, you but, might say, actually, you know what? They're all in it for, <laughs> for the wrong reasons. But I'm just trying to think maybe a little deeper of how these things don't get yeah. done. Uh, that, that, that was a really long way around uh, to did, a short point. 
yeah. Well, I just think I think that's, I think what you're raising there are really important points for us to think about in relation to climate change, but also many other big challenges as well. And I'm probably a little bit more charitable. I think there are some excellent MPs and have been on in all the parties. Uh, I do think, unfortunately, I think Johnson and some of his acolytes have pushed out a lot of the good ones from the Conservative Party. Now, I would have disagreed with these mm -hmm. people politically, but these yeah. are these are good people with integrity who were effectively pushed out. Basically, they were pushed out because they had integrity and Johnson didn't want anyone pe anyone like that in there. And I, I would say the current cabinet also don't particularly want people with integrity. But there are many good backbenchers across the parties. There does seem to be something about when you become a minister, you forgo that. And I think I think from an empirical experiment, as an observer of an empirical experiment, is Jeremy Hunt. When he was the chair of the select committee, the health select committee, he was excellent. Yeah. Real surprise that he was there. Outspoken, demonstrated integrity. You put him in back in government as a minister. And that goes out the window. Mm -hmm. So there's something there about the process of moving from a backbencher, even in that case, an influential backbencher along with this uh, involved with a select committee into a ministerial front bench position. And integrity gets thrown out, courage gets thrown out, honesty gets thrown out, and it becomes deeply party political in short term. And I well, think but... Hunt has absolutely demonstrated that. I mean, there are other people out there who just simply aren't fit for purpose. There are plenty of MPs who are simply not up to the job, but there are also good MPs out there. And I think we have to give credit to those who work very hard as backbenchers, doing mm -hmm. their constituency work, involved with the select committees. And unfortunately, we tar them all with the same brush um, because I think that by and large, the ministers have let us down. And I would also say, I think the, the prime minister's question time and having that televised or reported on at all gives us a sense that what it's that's what it is always like. Of course, it's not. That's yeah. a that's a particular little um, sort of part of the week that's there just to, just Theater. to yeah. um, entertainment sort of entertain really. Yes, it's yeah. not about what goes on there on a day to day basis. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we have to be careful to, to, to decry all of the political process. I think there's a lot of very good things in there. The first mm -hmm. past the post voting system is deeply problematic, but the select committee hearing is a, is is good. And that process, those processes are, are good. Um, so th there's lots of there, lots there to be to be pleased about and almost proud about in the UK. But there are other really important elements we need to change and change urgently, particularly, I think, at the ministerial level. I, I wonder if actually, you know, to go, go back to the start of this conversation, is that actually if that equality gap between the people in power and people without it has grown so big that their ability to not countenance ordinary people and the responsibility they actually have outside their own ego has been exacerbated by that somewhat but um i, I want to move on yeah, and this is going to get so political but it's a very very, very interesting but so there's, a, there's, a, point. So there's a p a key bit that fits with the sort of the climate agenda there though is that that inequality is is mirrored in our in terms of our emissions yeah. and that tells us a lot about a policy landscape the policy landscape has to be, have at its heart um the issues of equity as I said before, it's not not for any political reason or moral reason. I mean, we could have that as well, but it doesn't have to be that. It can simply be for the mathematical reason of delivering on our on our Paris commitment. So if we think we should deliver on those, that inequality you're talking about there is mirrored so closely in terms of our emissions. And that tells us a lot about what the framework of the policies needs to be, what those policies need to look like, who they need to apply to mostly. But of course, the people making those policies are the people with the high emissions. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, in, totally. in the absence of others pushing them very hard, they are they have demonstrated their deep reluctance to embed equity, fairness mm. within within the policy landscape. Kind of continuing on policy then, and this is something that you brought up in your talk the other week. Uh, the the term net zero, as you said, like seemingly appeared overnight. And mm. when I was kind of thinking about this when you said this the other week, I was like, yeah, I know I've just been saying it for years and don't actually remember when I first heard it and it's just like come out of the ether somewhere. So for the people out there that, you know, maybe say it themselves but don't really know what it actually means, what does net zero mean for a start? And are we on track to meet that by 2050 as outlined in the Paris Agreement right now? Yeah. Right, well, there's a lot in what you've asked there. Yeah. Um, for, and I completely... From a sort of more abstract scientific perspective, the concept of net zero makes some sense. So it's the idea that whatever emissions we put out into the atmosphere, and we can't eliminate all emissions if, you know, if we're going to have agriculture, for instance, even if we all went vegetarian and, and changed our agricultural practices, you would still have some emissions from fertilizer, some emissions yeah. from, um, from plowing land and so forth. So you cannot eliminate all of the emissions at the global level. 
And because um, those emissions will keep in, in, in causing some level of warming, you have to compensate for that with some mm. level of sinks absorbing greenhouse gases as well. So at that purely sort of scientific level, that works and makes some sort of sense. And it was sort of used as a shorthand sometimes, occasionally. Yeah. But then it was quite quickly switched into being used in the sort of policy landscape. And there it's been, I would say almost from the beginning, it has been abused. Mm. So it, and, and what it what it does, it allows us to, to use sort of accountancy scams. It allows us to compare things that aren't really compa comparable. Right. Um, so it allows us to compare between the different greenhouse gases, when they have very different um, impacts in the atmosphere, different chemistries, how long they last in the atmosphere and all those other things. It allows us to compare between different sources. So we can say, um, it's okay, we're going to um, change our animal husbandry with pigs, and that allows us to drive a bit further. Yeah, yeah. So you sort of, you know, the completely different things with different levels of certainty, different activities by different people, and often talking about different gases. But it also allows you to spread it over time. So it's, don't worry, we can carry on expanding airports today, because we're going to make sure that we plant enough trees that will suck the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere in 2040. Yeah, and those yeah. sorts of accountancy scams, they all look fine on a spreadsheet, but but they don't play out in reality. They've got different atmospheric chemistries, different lifetimes in the atmosphere, and huge different levels of certainty. If you mm. drive or fly or whatever that might be, or heat your home with gas, whatever that might be, there's a guaranteed amount of carbon dioxide for the amount of fuel you're emitting. That's guaranteed. But if you plant a tree, there's no guarantee by 2030 that won't have been chopped down and used for furniture or been burnt or, or died because of some movement in pests as, as the climate has warmed. Yeah. Um, so th there's a lot of difference about issues of certainty. The other thing with, neg with net zero, which has been incredibly um, just divisive, I think, really, is the concept of negative emission technologies. I mean, I almost, it almost rolls off my tongue now. <laughs> um, and I was thinking about it earlier today, actually. It's, a, sort of, it's, a, it's like it's a fairy tale concept that somehow at huge scale, we're going to find ways to suck carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Negative emission technologies. I mean, we sort of say it yeah. next. We give it an acronym as if well, you can go out and get it. You, you said this in the talk that um, I think it was in the IPCC. IPCC uh, I'll start again. You said this in the talk. IPCC. The, the, the IPCC. PC. <laughs> You said in the talk that the projections for the IPPC, is that the right? Fuck. Anyway, you said in the talk. <laughs> IPCC. Into thank you. <laughs> you said in the talk that um, kind of our projections for 2050 require the carbon removal industry to be the same size as the oil and gas industry as it is now. Yeah, roughly. Which, yeah. Uh, well, I can't really comprehend the size of the oil and gas in industry in my head, but I'm assuming it's, to use some French, Big. fucking massive. Yeah, the oil and gas industry is a huge industry. And what is concerning is that all of the, what we call scenarios, which are like um, uh, pictures of the future, but, and yeah. they, they inform policy about what we need to do. Without exception, every single scenario produced in the IPCC reports, reported in their, given in their reports, includes um, huge quantities of what are called carbon dioxide removal. Most yeah. of that is through these negative emission technologies. So technology industries that are roughly the same size as our current oil and gas industry that don't exist today. We have a few small pilot schemes, but they're very small pilot schemes. There's, there's no sense at the moment that they can be scaled up in anything like the level that would be necessary. Yeah. And yet every single estimate of the future or guess, guesstimate about the future assumes they will be. But they have to do that because all of those models assume ongoing economic growth. All of those models assume ongoing wealth increases in the global north. None mm -hmm. of those um, uh, models see equity as, a, as an important issue. Um, and so they, they, they don't want to rock the political boat. They don't want to rock the, the economic boat. And to do that, mm -hmm. the only way they can reconcile all of this is to say, we'll remove the carbon dioxide in the future. And when we first started talking about that, people thought it was a bit, a bit sort of wacko. It's a bit, well, what is this thing? But now... The more it's been spoke about and then locked into this language of net zero, yeah. it's been completely, completely normalized, but it still doesn't yeah, it's exist. It's very mainstream now, yeah. It, it is completely mainstream that whether you're a council, whether you're a company, a sports yeah. club, a university, a government, everyone says we're, we've got a net zero target of one sort or another. When yeah. you look at these things, they don't mean zero. They never mean zero. They mean actually reduce the emissions to some sort of level and have quite a large residual left after that. And they mm. always put it as a long time in the future or mostly yeah. they put it a long time in the future. Um, yeah. So I think at every level, the this concept of net zero has been incredibly destructive because not only is it muddled up the actual science, if you like, the different greenhouse mm. gases and so forth and allowed the accountants 
to you know the bean counters to to be quite fraudulent but it's also changed the sort of way the rest of us have thought um, yeah. and the time frames of action so when you talk about net zero 2050 that puts very little pressure on a policymaker in 2024 if you exactly. said you've got to be zero fossil fuels by 2030 or 2035 that would be a very different story but net zero 2050 is so far away they know they're going to either be dead or living in tuscany by then the net zero isn't zero in 2050 they never are so yeah, in the no. uk the 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 plan for the uk following the advice of the, of the government's committee on climate change it still has about 30 odd million tons of carbon dioxide from fossil fuel combustion in 2050 and they call it net zero that's more emissions from fossil fuels per person in 2050 than wow. you get from a typical kenyan citizen today and we call that net zero yeah <laughs> i was going to say kevin it reminds me very much i think in a way we're sort of bred to want the status quo psychologically we're sort of we're, we're born into capitalism we're growing up around consumerism we like our comforts and whatnot yeah so it's mm. almost like it reminds me a little bit like recycling so what everybody forgets is recycling is like number four on the importance so you've got reuse <laughs> maybe even lower, reduce <laughs> reduce reuse um repair and then it's recycle yeah but those yeah. first three are inconvenient. <laughs> so we land on yeah. we land on recycle because it's the easy one. It's the one we just pick up. We've got a couple of bins and you do that and that. And now that as re recycling has absorbed itself, hardwired itself into our conscience that you go to any man on the street, any woman on the street, any child, anybody, right? What do you do? What's but what is it about environment that you do? Oh, recycle. Okay, it's hardwired, but we know as People that are in this and we understand and we've seen research out, recycling is not going to save the planet. Yeah. And it's a little bit like net zero. There's a lot of things that come before we, we, we settled psychologically on net zero, but they were all really hard. They were all inconvenient. Yeah. It meant that people would lose money. It meant that firms would lose money and whatnot. And then all of a sudden, somebody came up with net zero and everyone just went, yes, yes, no, I can live with hmm. net zero. I can live with net zero. Because net zero means I do fuck all today or tomorrow, yeah, and someone further down the line will sort this mess. And I think that's why it becomes part of our zeitgeist. It's it's, it's the things that yeah. mean we don't really have to do anything. And businesses can can say, oh, that actually we can sell that, we can push that, we can make it sound really positive, and we can make it sound like we're doing something when really we ain't. Well, I, I half agree with you. Um, That's because, uh, yeah, <laughs> the reason I say that is because I think net zero is not there to protect most people from difficult decisions. Because I would argue that for most people, dealing with climate change is going to be beneficial for them at so many levels, yeah. at the comfort levels, the sort of things you were talking about. The mm -hmm. problem is that for a relatively small group of us, now whether that may be 10, 20, possibly 30% of our population, it will be inconvenient. Materially, it will be inconvenient. You know, we will not be able to have the luxuries that we've got completely used to and we think that we deserve. Mm. But for a lot of people in the UK, it would mean improvement in house and quali the quality of the houses that they, li that they live in. So less fuel, po well, eliminating fuel poverty, I mean, which would mean then that their, their children would live in houses that didn't have all the fungal spores because they were poorly heated, which means their mm -hmm. children have better health opportunities, which means their children have better educational opportunities. It means the air outside, because they, the poorer houses are where the cars drive past and the richer yeah. areas going to work, the air outside the houses would be better quality. Again, better for the people living there, for the children, for bronchial conditions and so forth. It would also mean you have a massive jobs agenda in retrofitting people's homes, in electrifying a lot of our industry, in electrifying whatever heating we require, in putting in the new nuclear power, new um, renewable power stations and other low carbon sources to put the power lines in. All of that is a very long-term job, uh, secure jobs agenda. But all of that requires significant resources. Where do those resources come from? They come from people like me. They mm. come from the relatively wealthy in our society who has got used to the, the, the fruits of, of, of um, modern society. We've disproportionately benefited from that, and we are mm. not prepared to forgo that. And yet that, that resources and labor are required to retrofit 25 million homes in the UK, are required to electrify our industries and our heating and our transport network, are required to build the chams, the buses, you know, the, the wind turbines. All of that requires a lot of labor and resources. But those labour and the resources are currently being, you know, hel helping, you know, furnish the relative luxuries of people like me, and that's the that's where net zero works. It protects people like me and the well mm -hmm. relatively wealthy in society, 
but it doesn't protect the poorer people. No. They will suffer, continue to suffer from ongoing impacts of f food price instability, energy mm -hmm. price instability, low quality homes, rubbish public transport, a, fr um, a fragmenting infrastructure. That's what most people will be having to deal with. And so again, it comes back to this equity issue. If we want to respond to climate change, there are a lot of material, physical things we've got to do to our infrastructure in the, somewhere like the UK, indeed every country. But to do those things means we have to move from private luxury to private sufficiency. And then we can have, if you like, public luxury. We can have, we can all have a really good public transport network. We can yeah. have, um, you know, good libraries, good schools, good um, yeah. swimming pools. But that means you can't have private schools, private swimming pools, pri you know, private four-wheel drives, huge houses, second homes, third homes. All of those things, which a relatively small group of us have really enjoyed, are not viable if you're trying to convert the rest of society very rapidly to be decarbonized. Now, once you've done all of this, we can go back to massive inequality if we think it's a really wonderful thing to have. But in the interim, <laughs> you have no choice if you are serious about our climate commitments, but to make society much, much fairer. Yeah. I think what I was getting at is it's only if you act on it. If you act on net zero, it benefit somewhere, but it's, it's almost like a, it can be put up as something that we're going to do but not necessarily you're forced to do it because because it's so because they're gonna date so far off into the future, we're yeah. kind of relying on their will to do it. Now if they do it, yeah. and like you know, exactly as you've said there, there is benefits to it. But I do feel like it's just used as a term, very much like recycling, in yeah. regards to we'll do it tomorrow. Yeah, I think you're Don't right. Worry, we'll do it uh, tomorrow. Yeah. No, I think I think it is another delay. I mean, climate change, its history has been since since really the the oil majors, the oil executives, many of them are still in significant positions, positions of power. They basically lied about the climate science for 30 or so years. Mm. And eventually it was so obvious that climate change is happening and that the science is broadly correct. Then what they and others have been doing is delaying action. And that's what net zero has done. And unfortunately, I think that a lot of the collective science body has actually, though it did a fantastic job on the climate science, despite all of the, um, the opposition, from the well-funded opposition, but from the oil majors, I think they, the expert community has broadly let society down in mm. terms of what we need to do about climate change. It's been reluctant to say the things that are necessary because they have political repercussions. Um, and, that, and so we have been party, by and large, the expert community has been party to the delay that we're seeing, which I this is why I'm actually very much in favour and thankful for a lot of the civil society movements. Because if it wasn't for the civil society movements in our society, we wouldn't even be where we are today. If we yeah. relied on the experts and the scientists, strangely, we we haven't been prepared to say what the repercussions of our own analysis are. We've had to rely mm. on civil society to do that for us. We have run too scared of funding issues. We've run too scared of being uh, labelled an extremist. I personally think you know, heading for three or four degrees centigrade is extremist. Trying to stay yeah. below two is not extremist. But it... We have we have we have deliberately kept silent. It's not that we've been kept silent by others. I think we have chosen to be silent because it is much easier. And um, so that delay part of net zero plays really very well into the expert community as well. Mm. And until we actually are prepared to stand up and be counted for how we have chosen to fail for so long, we will continue with that, and the temperature will just continue to rise. You were. I, I'm going to kind of got a few more questions about your talk the other week. Um, you said that we kind of require a 30% cut in personal energy use by 2030 to stay within the Paris um, kind of. I think it was. I think it was nearly 50%. Line. Oh, 50, even worse. I think well, it was what, about my, yeah, roughly a 50% cut on average. Yeah. So where, my my question was going to be like I understand what that looks like for you know uh, a Kim Kardashian type who has you know 17 private jets and you know more yeah. more houses than fingers, but like. When someone reads that from, like, you know, for, uh, if they're, you know, working class, to them, that sounds like, you know, is that me getting rid of my phone? Is that me, you know, turning off the electric in my house? I know you've made your point about equity a lot as well, but is that is that 50% cut, like, distributed heavily as well towards the rich in, in kind of in your wider point? A absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It's an average cut. And actually, I would like to see some of the households in the UK, I would like to see their emissions go up. Because right, if the yeah. emissions go up in the UK, some of the poor areas around Manchester, around where the university is, some of the people around there who are living in fuel poverty, I would like them to have cheaper energy and their emissions go up because they burn more energy to make their houses warmer. Yeah. Now, that requires people like me, some of the bigger houses in Wilmslow and Alderley Edge and others of us to cut back, to not be flying, 
to you know to to not own huge four wheel drives, all those other things. So it, the 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 division of of the of the effort that's necessary is is really important. Mm. And actually, for a lot of people in our society, it's not an issue about agency for them. They don't really have, with a few exceptions, they don't really have the agency to bring about change. They often live in rented accommodation or a house they can only just about afford. They can't afford solar panels on the roof. They can barely yeah. afford draft excluder. They can't yeah. afford to get themselves a nice electric car. So they're running an older car that's a bit inefficient. They won't drive very far in it, typically won't drive so far in it. And so for those particular groups, there's actually not a lot that they can do themselves. They can make some changes and that's great if they can do it. Where yeah. their agency exists is actually political. Mm. They can have their voices heard. They can push the policymakers, the councils and others for better public transport. And collectively, they can have a strong voice. There is agency in them. those people like me and the wealthier of us in society. We have agency both to drive change ourselves, which then reflects on our, how other friends and colleagues and family see us, but also yeah. to drive political change because we're fortunate enough to be often in more influential positions. And so the, the process of change is really has to be much more fairly allocated in society, if you like. Yeah, um, yeah. And those, so those big cuts are primarily by the wealthier in society. And as I say, the poor end of society, actually, I would like to see their emissions rise. And if you remember as well on that slide that we're talking about here, the reason we were cutting energy consumption, particularly uh, personal energy consumption, and also within service industries and civil other um, uh, libraries and swimming pools and so forth to make all of those more efficient was to increase the energy consumption in industry and yeah. that's often missed that if we are going to decarbonize our society we've got to do all of this physical work which will require lots of energy and lots of labor yeah so my question with this one kevin is i completely understand uh what you say in regards to the wealthy in society really need to have their emissions cut not the not the poorest in society and like you say they should even have their emissions increased. You know, that makes complete sense to me. Um, from a policy perspective, how could you, have you ever thought about how this could be enforced? Um, not only in like a literal sense, but maybe one, because we obviously in our political system, it's about voting for a party to get in power in order to, to implement, you know, we're not, we're not a dictatorship. So is there any, sort of low-hanging fruit that you can see where it's like, do you know what? I think most people would get behind that. One of the ones that a colleague and I worked on a long time ago was was, was often given the label of personal carbon allowances, but other people have worked on this and given it different names. So there's a one's called a fee and dividend approach, which has been sort of particularly popular among some people in the States trying to push that argument. And actually that's quite interesting because the things like carbon taxes, which people have heard about when you put a price on carbon, so the, the more... Mm fossil fuels or gas you use the, the higher the price turns out to be that's that the problem with that that's deeply regressive if you're mm. living in a rubbish house somewhere um you, you have to use a lot of gas or a lot of electricity electricity to keep the place reasonably warm but there are also other things that people like um andy burnham's trying to push in the push in manchester that i think with a little bit more emphasis could also address some of the equity issues so he's trying to make a much better public transport system um but that the, the, what you need to do there is not is you can't just put something in place you've also got to close down the incumbents a bit like with renewables you can't just put renewables in place because they'll just add to the fossil fuels you've got to close the fossil fuels down and yeah. so you have to force mm. people out of their cars particularly the wealthy in this case out of their cars onto the public transport so the rest of us will be using the public transport but there's not an opportunity for the wealthy still to come in in their cars and we mm -hmm. see that in the university where um, still a lot of people drive in and get subsidized at least they have till recently i'm not sure what the rules are right now but subsidized parking and yet you know they're subsidized by the other people that are walking cycling or using public transport and that's yeah. the same for a lot of companies when you think about it you know a company buys some space for its car parks the people who walk to work are effectively subsidizing the people who are driving to work and so we've got to we've got to remove those sorts of um it's perverse incentives that uh, that we've normalized, mm. that we've sort of thought, well, that's perfectly reasonable. But why should the rest of us subsidize those few that are driving in? And so it, there, are, I think there are lots of ways that we can adjust the policy landscape so it takes fairness into account. Um, and and say, if we don't do that, we're going to fail on on our on our commitments. We're going to be pass on more and more climate change to our children. So it has to be absolutely at, at the core. But it does require policymakers to have courage. And it does ultimately require the policymakers to put in place policies that they and their families and friends would be most impacted by because mm. they typically are the wealthy people in society. <clears throat> yeah, I think to that's... Kinda... 
Oh, yeah, so I was going to say, I think that's really important what you said there, especially the part where you say when you implement these these more green policies, um, there has to be, at the other side, there has to be a decrease. Whatever language you want to give it, the obsession with growth is a real problem. Mm. Because um, if, you, if, you, if you develop a green product, and it substitutes for a, a less, let's imagine it does substitute for something else that's dirty, but then you grow more and more of that green product, then it can still end up being worse. Yeah. And so the actual absolute level of something is also key. You can't just look about, is this slightly better than that? Yeah, but, well, it might be, but if you, if you use twice as many of them, then it's not. <laughs> and so, the, the, and, and if, unfortunately, our society is structured in such a way, not just the companies, but our, our, our institutions, our universities, everyone's it's always about growth, getting bigger, getting more. Now that, and, and I think that's a real problem. And it's become sort of locked in our psychology as if that's a natural human condition. Yeah. That hasn't been true, as I understand it. It hasn't been true through most of human history. It hasn't always desired to have greater and greater levels of consumption. It is true that the Romans spread their empire out, but they didn't. The, the sense of individual material wealth didn't change so significantly. And I gather that's the same with quite a lot of other um, other sort of previous civilizations. As, as ours is this very rapid ongoing levels of growth. Um, and so I think that we've normalized that as if that is a human trait. It's not. It's a post-industrial trait so the industrial revolution has brought that about post-enlightenment has brought that about and it looks very quickly within within really 150 years of being able to use fossil fuels and have this ongoing growth mentality we're already coming up against, against sort of the buffers of living on a round planet not just climate change but you know the the damage we're doing to the oceans to our fresh water systems to biodiversity to to you know to almost every sort of natural facet of our planet we're up against the buffers already within just 150 mm. years of this modern system. It's completely incompatible with living on, on a round planet. And yet yeah. we, and, and every one of our curves, every one of our plots, all of our observations tell us this. And yet somehow we're so locked up in, in our current mindset that we, we think we'll be able to find a way out of it. It's, uh, it's quite worrying, I think, that we, well, I, I sometimes think, are we a genetic cul-de-sac? Have we actually got to a point where we simply are ill-equipped to survive on this planet mm. but you know uh, the, the idea of growth was really popularized in the 50s and the early 60s and, and and as opposed to like you know it being inherent to i think in you know industrial capacity um but yeah i, I, I kind of take the point as well um i just wanted to kind of finish off by going back to the the science um the kind of climate science to round off um you, you, the, the thing, the last thing that really struck out of me from your talk was you said that it's not necessarily the temperature increase of the planet that is the problem; it's the rate in the increase of the impacts. Mm. Could you explain that? It, it's very tempting. Those who work on climate change, we talk about one and a half degrees centigrade of warming or two degrees centigrade of warming, and mm -hmm. for most people, that means nothing. In a cold day in Manchester, I mean, you know, so what? Yeah. But what we're talking really about is not temperature that's not our main concern our main concern when we go to all these national uh, national um, um, international events every year to talk about well what what should we try and do on climate change what we're trying to do is avoid dangerous levels of impacts mm. so it's the impacts that are that are important not the temperature so imagine we had two degrees centigrade of warming but it occurs over a thousand years well does that really matter but if two degrees centigrade of warming occurs over a hundred years well, actually, society can't change that rapidly. Ecosystems can't mm. change that rapidly. We can't evolve rapidly enough for us. So it's not the temperature, but it's the rate of change of temperature. But even there is, we might be able to say, well, okay, but we can do certain things to adapt to, to climate change. So we might be able to deal with some areas at some levels of sea level rise. We might be able to deal with some uh, some levels of drought. We can we can become much more efficient in how we use our water. And so we can do lots of things to negate some of those impacts. But at some point, those impacts are going to get, grow faster and faster. So we can deal with a bit of sea level rise. But if that sea level rise doubles, we can't. If it triples or quadruples, we're stuffed. And so what matters is the rate of change of impacts. You know, the change of impacts, if they're going at a gradual level, we can deal yeah. with those impacts. It's an evolving, you know, the, we live on an evolving planet. Ecosystems evolve, human systems evolve. Mm -hmm. But if the rate of change of those impacts is faster than what we can evolve to, either us or other species, then, yeah. hey, we're, we're, we're going backwards. Then we yeah. fail. And, and temperature is a proxy for that. So when we, when we talk about two degrees centigrade, we're talking about two degrees centigrade in the next few decades. We're not talking about two degrees centigrade in a thousand mm -hmm. years. We're talking about a time frame, how fast 
do we get to two mm. degrees centigrade? How fast do we get to one and a half? <laughs> yeah, definitely. I think I think actually, okay. what to me it sounds like a really good rebuttal to people who are climate deniers. If there's still any left, you know, that talk about the fluctuations in the Earth's temperature, but you know yeah. that happened over millions of years <laughs> versus happening in fifty years, which yeah. is yeah, that's great. A very stark it's, it's, difference. It's, it's almost overnight, and that's the thing. I think it, it, there is a problem for us is we're not very good at addressing the sort of concepts of time. It appears that mm. that that seems to be the way we somehow, somehow think our own lifetime is a long time. In, well, in some mm. respects, it is, but in terms of um, evolution and ecosystems, it's not at all. It's just it's it's just a second or a fraction of a second. And so, yeah. when we're talking about these sort of you know two degrees temperature change over really what's just going to be little more than a hundred years, it's just huge, staggering. Yeah. We've we've seen staggering. nothing like yeah. that in human history. No, yeah. um, right. And so I think that there are problems here because we we live. At least it's tempting to think we live increasingly short-term lives. We sort of think about the, much more about the near term. We don't really think so much about the past, and we don't think so much about the, the distant future. Some societies, some cultures have done that. Mm -hmm. They don't even have a concept of past and future in the way that we have. Um, I think ours is really obsessed with the present. Doesn't really. It's prepared to discount or forgo the future, and we don't really want to learn lessons from the past. <laughs> so there are certain things about our current culture which do seem quite sort of um, at odds with living a good life on a, on a round planet. Well, yeah. I, I, I suppose it, it's our job of this show to kind of, you know, try and find ways to get around that and do the best for the planet as much as we can. Um, we're going to press on in, into the shout out to round off this show. Um, this is the part of the show where we give a bit of love to someone who's doing excellent work, trying to repair the earth and hopefully not increase that rate of impacts. So uh, Kevin, who is it your shout out for this week? Well, it's it's one person that links to others. So I gave a talk um, to Derbyshire and Nottinghamshire Council, with the climate officers from the councils, um, two days ago at, uh, I think it was the County Hall in in Mat beautiful building in Matlock. Mm -hmm. There was no heating in the room because they couldn't afford the heating. Christ. And the person who organised that had to buy the tea and coffee and the biscuits because there's no budget for the tea and coffee and the biscuits. So whilst everyone else thinks councillors are living up, drinking champagne, the reality is so far removed mm -hmm. from that. This was a really engaging, interesting event with fantastic um, climate officers from the councils, councils that have got absolutely no budget. They've been absolutely screwed into the ground mm -hmm. in every aspect, and yet they're still... These people are there trying to deliver the best they can with almost no budget um, on issues of climate change. And it was just so uplifting to see this group of people who had everything up there, up against them in terms of delivering on their job, doing the best that they possibly could. And I, I just I, and I also that I felt they need that shout out because it's a bit like social workers. <laughs> we only ever hear about them when it goes wrong. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. You know, these people are trying day in, day out in very difficult circumstances to drive, in this case on climate change, drive really progressive, good policies. And I think we need to give much more thought to, the, to, the, to these people who are working within the councils trying to deliver you know, all the aspects of, of our modern society that we rely on. Our bins, partly our schools, partly our policing, our, our safety, our roads, and all of those things and, and issues of climate change. And I think we we criticise them all the time when really they're working in very difficult situations. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Um, it was Rena Jones that organised it, and she's the uh, she she runs really um, a sort of uh, a collective for both for the climate officers from both the um, Nottinghamshire and Derbyshire councils. So to Brilliant. all the councillors out there, Great. shout out for them. <laughs> yeah, shout out, shout out to Rena. Yeah. Nice one. Yeah, to my brothers and sisters in the public sector. Um, yeah, I, th yeah. I, th I think actually get, that really ties back into what we were talking earlier about, you know, um, the political class at the moment is that, you know, not to, not to, uh, you know, construct an air balls, but people like him don't understand how you build a state. They don't understand how you build a society and what it takes to actually do it. They only understand power and how it can be used as opposed to what it could make. And I think that's yeah, what we have I don't to think change interested in building a state. I think you're being too generous to some of these ones. I think some of the ones here, you know, people like like him that you're referring to, I don't think they're interested in building a state. I don't think they're interested in building a good community. I don't think they're interested in particularly in power. They're interested in owning themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and they will use and abuse everything they can around them for their own well-being, for their yeah. own prestige, and and not for the betterment of society. But they're, fortunately, there are other good ones out there um, who who want a progressive you know, um, society so let's 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 vote for them and uh, um, 
more power to their arm. Uh, thank you so much yes. for watching. If you did, did you have, you can subscribe to this on YouTube. Uh, you can su support us on Patreon. There's a Patreon link in the description. Give us some money. We're going to send ads to Wales to speak to some people who are suffering from climate change already in the next couple of weeks, which is very exciting. And he needs a bus ticket. So uh, <laughs> support us on that. And we'll see you next time. Brilliant. Thanks. Goodbye. Cheers, everyone. Thanks, guys.